My dear brothers and sisters, I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, happy beginning of the church year. This is the first Sunday of Advent. Um, this particular year, it comes hard on the heels, of course, of Thanksgiving. It doesn't always happen quite that soon. So I hope you all had a uh, blessed Thanksgiving with family and friends. This one morning, I want to say a couple of things about Advent by way of a personal story from a few years ago. But before I get to that story, I want to share a couple words uh, of context again around the word Advent itself. Advent, you may remember, um, comes from a Latin word that means arrival or coming. Uh, and it is inevitable because the season of Advent falls right before Christmas that we think of that arrival or that coming prom primarily in the form of Jesus coming as a little baby. One of the important things I want to remind us this morning, though, is that as Christians, um, actually the entire year, the entire Bible, our entire Christian life, is an Advent kind of life. Um, and there are actually a few different ways that Jesus comes to us. Yes, Jesus comes at Christmas as a baby, that's the incarnation. But then Jesus, we, we confess as Christians, will come again. He will come to judge the living and the dead, we confess in the creed. The whole New Testament, in some ways, is uh, talking about that second coming. And another way we can think about the coming of Jesus is uh, between those two periods. His original coming 2,000 years ago, his coming at the end of time. And in our lifetimes, we invite Jesus to come into our hearts uh, every day. And so I mention that because without that context, the first set of readings for this first week of Advent are a little bit confusing. We assume that we're here to prepare the way for Jesus as a little baby, and there's certainly truth to that. But we also come to be reminded about that second coming, which is what the passages today are all about. So I want to talk uh, or lift up a couple points about that second coming, again, by way of a personal story which, appropriately for this time of year, starts with football. There's a lot of football this time of year, Thanksgiving, right? And by the way, congratulations to the Wyzetta Trojans, undefeated state champions. They won on Friday. Well done, Trojans. Um, the Gophers did not fare quite as well yesterday, um, and we will pray for the Vikings tomorrow. Um, <laughs> My story involves a football game that took place in South Bend, uh, Indiana, 22 years ago. Um, the date was November 1st, 1997. Um, importantly, as a context for this story, and my wife does not know I'm retelling this story this morning, my wife, who's sitting over here, was eight months and one week pregnant at the time. Um, I was a graduate student at Notre Dame. November 1st was a Saturday, so it was a game day. Notre Dame was playing Navy. Um, it was a terrible cold, it wasn't uh, snowing, but it was raining, cold, windy. It was an awful day in terms of the conditions. And one thing you may not know about the stadium at Notre Dame is that the student section, undergrads and graduates, stand for the entire game. Did I mention my wife was eight months and one week pregnant? <laughs> and we had already walked a number of blocks to get to the stadium. So we're standing for the first half. Um, and by halftime, and we rarely did this, but by halftime we were completely kind of like, this is enough of this. And so Amy and I decided to go back home to our apartment in downtown South Bend, um, and about six or eight of my classmates joined us. And we watched the second half of the game in the warmth and comfort of our apartment, sitting on a couch, watching it on the television. I remember this very vividly. The game Concluded, the final whistle blew, Notre Dame won. I know that will not make some of you happy. People tend to feel very strongly about Notre Dame. But Notre Dame won, and after the final whistle blew, uh, I hear from the other uh, room, Amy saying, Tim, um, <clears throat> which I think, in fairness, she had been saying for a few minutes, maybe. I was had, um, <clears throat> and I went and found her, and uh, she said to me, I think that my water broke. And being the completely clueless young husband that I was at that time, I hope I've become a little less clueless since then, by the way, my response to that, to, to that was, well, that's not possible, because then that would mean we're having the baby. <laughs> 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 
Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> now, this is going to lead to the first point I want to make about Advent, but a Amy and I were uh, expecting a child, no question about that. We were uh, prepared in some way conceptually that we were going to be welcoming another member into our family. I promise you, though, we were not ready for that child to appear that particular day. Um, and so we threw a few things into a bag very quickly. Again, I had some of my friends who were classmates, uh, dear people, um, do a few errands for us, and they were going to meet us at the hospital on the way to the hospital. Um, and just to be clear about this, this was Amy's idea, not mine. Someone yelled at me after the last service about this. We stopped at a drugstore to get this thing called film. Do you remember film? <laughs> For the camera. And we arrived at the hospital, and within about five or six hours, our first son, Luke, was born. All right. Two points I want to lift up about how that story is related again to Advent in the sense of this second coming, Jesus returning at the end of time. The first, and again, the entire New Testament in some ways is about this, is that again, as Christians, we expect Jesus' arrival. He will come again, we confess, to judge the living and the dead. The New Testament is also very clear that we don't know when that day will be. And Jesus himself says, it's not uh, for me to know or the angels in heaven to know, only God knows. So one point I would make, this is not the primary point, but one point I would make is, as Christians, we should not try to predict that day. Christians have tried over the centuries and millennia to do that. It's never worked out. So instead, what we should do as Christians is what? Is we should live our lives expecting to meet Jesus today. That's how we should go about our lives, assuming that we will meet Jesus today. Which brings us very quickly to the second point, because the first point I just made, we should live as if we're going to expect to meet Jesus today, sounds a little threatening, doesn't it? It's a little like, he's coming again. Watch out. And if you haven't seen it, the, the bumper sticker that sort of uh, encap encapsulates this is, um, maybe you've seen it, Jesus is coming, look busy. And it's funny, and we laugh, but we laugh because beneath it is, I think, something that speaks the truth to us. We think, yeah, he's coming again, and I, he might be coming, you know, because he's mad at me. Or he might be coming to get even, or he might be coming to find me doing something that I really shouldn't be doing. And part of the point I want to make is, if that's how we think about the second coming, if that's how we think about the end of time, that will inform how we live today. It will make us uh, live out of a sense of fear and worry and insecurity. And so what I want to suggest this Advent is that we let God sort of recalibrate our, uh, the lenses of how we think about that second coming. When it happens, will it change everything? Yes. Will we be changed? Yes. Will all of creation be changed? Yes. And does that bring with it a certain amount of fear? Certainly, yes, it does, because it will be different. But the Bible says in all kinds of places, including the reading from Isaiah today and then again um, in some beautiful passages in Revelation, it gives us a hint of what that final time when Jesus returns will be. It talks about God bringing all people together on his holy mountain, nations lying down their arms, uh, swords being beaten into plowshares, uh, all falsehood being defeated by truth, the dead being raised, Satan himself being defeated, and death itself being destroyed once and for all. That is not something we should be scared about. It should be something that we anticipate with joyful, hope-filled expectation. I mentioned that the entire Bible in some ways is an Advent text, which I believe it is. And it concludes, you may not know this, you may know this, it concludes with three simple words. Come, Lord Jesus. My prayer for us this Advent is that we can pray that prayer, not from a sense of fear or concern, but with the kind of hope 
and joy-filled expectation that, I don't know, parents have when they're planning to welcome their first child. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Good and holy God, during this season of Advent, we anticipate your coming. Yes, as a little child at Christmas, and yes, in our hearts today, but we also pray that you will transform our hearts to await your final arrival with joy and hope and expectation. In all this we pray, in the holy name of Jesus, amen.